So we started talking about linear regression. And there, we found that we need to solve the following problem. By the way, to, the way to solve this thing is not really by inverting this, it's, it's not by finding the inverse matrix. So we do not do x, x transpose to the minus 1, x, y transpose. But instead, it's uh, numerically better behaved and usually a, a bit faster uh, to directly solve this for beta. In the days of MATLAB, um, there was the famous uh, backslash operator, which was a nice mnemonic because we could write uh, beta equals x, x transpose, backslash x, y transpose. And uh, this was meant to look a little bit like, I put this in quotation mark, x, y transpose divided by x, x transpose. Now, in Python, we don't have the backslash operator, but we have what lin alt solve or something, and this is what you want to use uh, to solve this equation here. But what the bottom formula does show us is that we know that there are matrices whose inverse exists. Uh, they are regular matrices. We know there are matrices whose inverse does not exist, irregular matrices, and there are matrices whose inverse nearly does not exist. Uh, and those are the ones of interest to us here. Uh, so this matrix uh, x, x transpose, uh, oftentimes it's not well conditioned. And this is not an exotic problem. This is a real problem that you face when you, when you work with data, which is why we're talking about here. What are possible reasons for this? Uh, one reason the statisticians call p greater n. So p was the number of dimensions that our measurements have. n is the number of measurements. And well, you know that uh, in, in an ordinary plane, uh, to fit a straight line, you need uh, two points. Uh, in a 3D space, uh, to fit a line, you need three points. Uh, but when you have fewer points than you have dimensions, then you are in trouble. And if you have as many points as you have dimensions, then you're still in trouble as long as there's some measurement noise. Yeah? So then uh, we will want to stabilize our estimate. Or another reason that we've seen is uh, collinearity or near collinearity in the observations. So we had these, uh, we stared at these plots for a long time last week of uh, where this was x1 and this was x2, and points here were nearly on a straight line, and we were arguing that we can estimate the slope in one direction well, but in the other direction. Uh, so along this line, uh, we can estimate, along this line, we can estimate the slope well, but orthogonal, so if we cannot estimate uh, the slope very reliably, and if we think about what this does to the system of equations, um, then let me sketch that as follows. Uh, so uh, a well-posed linear system of equations. And now there's no one-to-one -one correspondence to this plot, which is why I will uh, delete it. A well-posed linear system of equations is, you know, we have uh, two lines cutting, and they are cutting at, uh, uh, at a blunt angle. No? So if we have some uh, uncertainty in our observations why, this will translate uh, to a little bit of wiggling space in where exactly these uh, lines are. And then accordingly, our solution uh, will have some wiggle space around its intersection. If, on the other hand, 
our lines are like this. So the first one I leave as is, but the second one I now shift. Okay, you see currently they intersect here, but if we wiggle a little bit on these lines, then the solution can move a long way. And in this particular case, you would see that uh, as I can change the slopes or the offsets of these lines a little bit, um, my solution can change a lot in the green direction. Uh, it can change a lot in the green direction, uh, but it will not change so much in the blue direction. And uh, we translated this or we, we captured this effect in terms of uh, this covariance estimate for our parameter estimate beta hat. So I'm just giving you a different picture here to describe this problem of uh, having an ill-posed linear system of equations. And this uh, p larger than n is also a very frequent occurrence um, simply because if we think of, for example, medical domain uh, where we can have gene expression patterns, sometimes patients are hard to find. Yeah? So there is a new exotic disease and luckily we don't have too many patients, just 10 who have it, um, or uh, a rare hereditary you know, uh, disease. But we have uh, you know, tens of thousands of uh, expression levels of, of various genes. And uh, in that case, P is much, much bigger than N. But we're still interested in analyzing this data. Or last week, I mentioned this spectral data. We have hundreds or thousands of spectral channels, but we might not have that many samples. So there also, uh, P can be larger than N or, or not large enough to get a reliable estimate. So we need to do something about it. Now, first and in general, uh, not all hope is left. And the reason is that uh, so far we've been looking at ordinary least squares, uh, which has zero bias. But so zero bias meaning uh, in the limit of a very large uh, training set, we are going to recover the true parameter value, but the variance can be fairly high. And there are now various ways of uh, reducing this variance. But uh, you know, first, let's, let's write down this bias variance decomposition of the mean squared error. So we're looking at um, the expectation of our parameter estimate, theta hat. Minus the true parameter, theta. Well, we're taking this difference squared. Here I'm pretending that these are just uh, scalars. <clears throat> And we're now going to decompose this into variance and squared bias as follows. Um, first, we subtract and add something. So I'm subtracting the expectation of theta hat and I'm adding it back. So overall, I've done nothing yeah, because I've subtracted and added the same thing. But now we still have this quadratic expression and we can uh, multiply it out. And so we uh, get the first half of the equation squared So this is theta hat minus the expectation of theta hat 
squared. Then we have the second half of the equation squared. Well, because this is squared, I will uh, turn around uh, the arguments to bring it into a more recognizable form. So I'm going to uh, write, this is the expectation well, of, okay, so first, what about this outer expectation? Um, this was the true parameter. So if we take the expectation of some constant, uh, we just get out the constant. Here we take the expectation of our estimate, which is again some constant, and taking the expectation over it does not do anything. In other words, I can simply omit this expectation operator. And uh, its argument itself, I'm just turning around uh, to bring it into a more recognizable form. I'm going to write this is um, the No, it's fine. It's, I, I leave as is. So um, the thing inside the expectation operator, this expectation of theta hat minus theta, um, this has a name in statistics. This is the bias. This tells us um, how far in expectation our parameter estimate will deviate from the true parameter value. So if this is the bias, then the thing above, well, it's the squared bias. And the bias is just what this is called. And uh, this thing here is called the variance. So the mean squared deviation of our parameter estimate from the expected parameter as All right. Um, now above, we had this long equation, uh, which uh, was taken to the squared. So the first term squared was the variance, or the second half squared was the squared bias. We still have this cross term. So we have the expectation of theta hat minus expectation of theta hat. Times expectation of theta hat minus theta. And uh, by the same argument as before, this second half can just be pulled out of the expectation operator. It's not a random variable anymore. Uh, and overall, what this thing then becomes is the expectation of theta hat minus the expectation of theta hat times uh, what's written in the parentheses. But this is 0. And so everything here is 0 and just cancels. So, in other words, what we have just seen is that the mean squared error can be decomposed as variance plus squared bias. <clears throat> now, this was a you know completely generic, um, and in itself does not say yet uh, you know why it would why it could help to now start increasing the bias but what we find empirically is the following 
if we have some method and we start with a method, let's say that has a lot of flexibility or that has a large capacity. So let's say that maybe ordinary least squares would be here. Then as we start reducing these degrees of freedom, as we start limiting its flexibility, as we start to regularize it, then what will happen, so what, what we have here, this mean squared error, is a sum of uh, variance and of squared bias. Um, if we talk about uh, least squares, and if uh, least squares is truly the correct model, then the ordinary least squares model itself has zero bias. If we now start limiting the flexibility, well, this bias is going to increase. At the same time, we have uh, high variance initially, and this variance will decrease. So I should use different colors maybe. Um, let's say, I try to make this green. This would be the bias. Uh, I try to make uh, this blue, this would be the variance. Or I should write squared bias. But the sum of the two, the mean squared error, uh, it, it, does not, it does not have to remain constant. You see, these terms uh, are not linear, excuse me, the variance has disappeared. Um, both curves are not necessarily linear if we plot them as a function of uh, reducing flexibility. And hence, the mean squared error usually goes through some minimum and then is determined. So on the right-hand side, that the mean squared error would be uh, governed by the bias. So the bias is uh, the biggest, oh, wrong, it would be, excuse me, governed by the variance. Sorry. Uh, here the variance makes the biggest contribution. And on the other hand, over here, mean squared error would be governed by the bias. All right, and then, so we are trying to regularize in order um, to find a sweet spot. Usually the, the sweet spot is not the very minimum of this, uh, uh, of this curve, but usually uh, we try and be a little bit more conservative. Yeah? So we say, okay, let's simplify the model a little bit more uh, as long as our yeah, error does not seem to increase too much. Um, so this would be an appropriate amount of regularization here. Well, how do we how do we find it? <coughs> Typically by cross by cross validation. So the general idea. is to reduce the variance by limiting the flexibility of the model. and choose a sweet spot by cross-validation. <coughs> 
let's see if you can invent a concrete method. I will invoke again the pictures from last time. Good. Those were our three cases here. Uh, let's focus on this middle case. Uh, plotted here were the explanatory variables x1 and x2. The y is not shown, it's pointing in your direction. And we said that it's easy to estimate a slope in this direction. It's hard to estimate a slope in the, or not going to be very stable to estimate a slope in the orthogonal direction. Now, with what you've seen of machine learning so far, what could you think of? What have we seen in machine learning so far? There's, you know, the, the summary of methods discussed so far. PCA sounds good, because in PCA we had we made the same plot essentially. Yeah? We said uh, let's find the best subspace, and this is something we can do. Um, we can use PCA to. So let's we're going to look at three concrete methods today, and the first one. Concrete methods in the case of linear regression. And the first one is principal component, what is this called? What's the proper name? Uh, I have it somewhere. I think it's principal component regression. Yeah, PCR, PCR great. So you have just invented principal component regression. This is one reason, by the way, why statisticians for a long time have not liked machine learners, because machine learners just go ahead and invent something and it works, um, while statisticians were still busy, you know, proving consistency of, of something. And uh, now, you know, in the meantime, sort of, they've made peace, <laughs> kind of. <laughs> um, yeah, but machine learners, they, they usually, you know, they, they've often gone ahead and just tried something, and then the statisticians had a hard time understanding what's going on. And, and uh, uh, this random forest that we've discussed is a, is a particularly nice example of a method that works extremely well and is very difficult to characterize theoretically. But at the end of the day, of course, we want to to characterize these methods theoretically is just for some of them just turns out to be very hard. Anyway, <laughs> in uh, principal component regression, um, what we do is we project our data to an R dimensional subspace so with R less than P. And then do ordinarily squares in that subspace. So in, in terms of our famous picture here, x1, x2, some correlated observations, well, we first find, in this case, the one-dimensional subspace. We uh, project our data, or we approximate our data by its coordinates in the one-dimensional subspace. Yeah, so all observations are projected into that subspace. And well, now I can make a new plot. Uh, now I can make a new plot where this axis here is called principal component one. And my other axis is called y. So far, we did not have y in the plot at all. And 
well, I, I don't know what. Uh, I have to invent some whys now. Uh, and the whys were not shown in the previous plot. And then I do a linear regression in that plot. And well, then I have a model in that subspace. And when I now get new observations, I have to again project them into that subspace, apply the model in that subspace, and so on. Very good. So, one way to look at principal component regression is as follows. We can look at the eigenvalues of xx transpose, the scree plot that we were discussing in PCA. And we usually find some exponential decay, you know, something like this, with as many eigenvalues as we have uh, dimensions here. And if, for example, we project just to, uh, so if, for example, we make r equals 2, then we keep those and we, we kill the rest, we set the rest to zero. Or we ignore them completely. Now, by the way, um, why are these small eigenvalues a problem? Because we are computing x, x transpose to the minus one. Uh, so if x, x transpose was a diagonal matrix, then x, x transpose minus one would also be a diagonal matrix where we have in each entry um, the inverse of the eigenvalue. So in other words, it's the tiny eigenvalues that are the problem, because if we say one divided by some tiny number, we get something crazy large. Yeah? So these are, this gives us the crazy large slopes along our ill-defined directions. Now there's another idea to stabilize this taking of the inverse, um, namely to just add a constant to all of these eigenvalues. Yeah, so this brings us to method number two, which is called ridge regression. I will now motivate it not uh, by the eigenvalues, but uh, using a different argument here. Um, the argument is as follows. Let's minimize the squared residuals. So this would be ordinarily squares. But let's now penalize very, very large slopes. Yeah, so we're going to add a uh, user design parameter. That's our regular, regularization strength. And we're going to penalize the square norm of, of beta. So in, in other words, what we have here is um, we, ha we bias our solution towards modest slopes. <laughs> 
then we can, well, luckily we can still, still solve this in a closed form. And this is why this was uh, developed fairly early on. So 1970, maybe earlier. But at least, uh, you know, it was formally discussed in the statistics communities uh, starting in the 1970s. And so we're going to uh, differentiate this thing here with respect to beta. And okay, I'm going to write it out in, in all detail for you, but it's very similar to the expressions or the derivations that we've had previously for PCA and, and for ordinary squares. y transpose minus twice y x transpose beta plus beta transpose x x transpose beta plus this regularizer and if we now um, differentiate all of this with respect to beta What we get is the first term is independent of theta, beta, and then we get minus twice y x transpose using this numerator convention plus twice beta transpose x x transpose plus twice lambda beta transpose. And we want to set this to zero. And then we can uh, divide by two and say this is beta transpose times x x transpose plus lambda times the identity matrix and then we can transpose and we, we find that formally beta hat our estimate is x x transpose plus lambda times i to the minus one times x y transpose. Excuse me. There's a two too much. Thank you. All right, and if we compare this to the ordinary least squares thing, then it still has very much the same form, except that we now have this term from the ridge regularization. So if we look at this picture with the eigenvalues again, then uh, PCA has simply completely ignored all small eigenvalues. So we can say that uh, before taking the inverse, these eigenvalues have been put to plus infinity. And here they're not being put to plus infinity, but we add a constant to, we add a constant of lambda to all eigenvalues. And so if I try to uh, make a plot similar to, to the one above, then wait before you copy. So these would be the eigenvalues before, or these would be the uh, eigenvalue of x, x transpose. And now I'm adding a constant lambda to all of them. And I'm saying these are the new eigenvalues. I have uh, hence 
I have hence uh, stabilized this operation of taking the inverse. So in, in other words, I could say that this rich bias or the rich penalty it artificially inflates the covariance matrix x x transpose in all dimensions that is it spreads out the data along all dimensions Okay, my handwriting, sorry. I'm reading this. Rich penalty artificially inflates the covariance matrix X, X transpose in all dimensions. That is, it spreads out the data in all dimensions. So in other words, we could look at this. Um, now, I cannot really draw this by hand, huh? but... Um, if these were my observations, x1 and x2, it is as if we had pulled the data a little bit apart in all dimensions. So we would have pulled it a little bit apart along the line along which data lies, but we would also have pulled it a little bit apart uh, in the orthogonal direction. And uh, well, that of course leads to a lowering of the slope. So I, I can show it to you what happens, you know, in, in a one-dimensional example. So here I just have x and y. Um, I have two observations which are close by, and I get this slope. Now I pull my data a little bit apart. Yeah? So I'm saying the left observation goes here, and the right observation goes there, and I'm getting a new estimate, which is, of course, much flatter. Yeah? That would be the, the rich estimate in one dimension for some value of lambda. And the same happens in higher dimensions. Now, a good book to read up on this is our standard textbook, because the authors have worked a lot in this domain. And what we see in this plot is what happens, how the coefficients develop for increasing regularization strength. So from left to right, I am increasing the regularization. So lambda goes up. And at this point here, uh, lambda would be 0. Uh, at that point here, uh, lambda goes to infinity. And we see how the regression coefficients develop in between. So in other words here, um, we have the ordinary least squares model. And we have here, for some regression problem, the aim here was to predict uh, prostate cancer from these various uh, explanatory variables. We see what coefficients we get initially. And as we now start increasing this regularization strength, you can see that generally all of these coefficients become smaller. That's because we have a penalty on the size of the coefficients in our objective function. But there are also some interesting phenomena. Um, for example, uh, we have some crossovers. So this uh, PGG45 initially has a higher coefficient than LBPH. And then as we regularize more and more, uh, actually they, they cross over. We even have um, things changing sign. So, uh, for example, with no regularization, uh, age here has a small but negative coefficient, which to me sounds like, and I have not looked at the model, at the details of the model, but it sounds like uh, uh, 
the higher your age, the lower your risk for prostate cancer. And now, as you start regularizing more, then actually age does get a positive sign at some point. So it's interesting that they can even change sign. Now, the good news is that uh, in terms of uh, computational and implementation effort, uh, it's super easy, which is also why this was the first method to be studied in the 1970s. It was very much the same thing that we always said, except we now add a little bit of uh, identity matrix to our covariance matrix. Very easy computation. OK, unfortunately, you see that the model does not truly become sparse. Yeah? So as we regularize more and more, eventually all coefficients become zero. Uh, but we do not lose single coefficients from our model on the way. And in the spirit of uh, simplifying our model, it would be desirable if we could really set some of the coefficients exactly to zero. Because, well, let's say you know age is something that's uh, cheap to determine. You just ask the patient. But maybe some of these other measurements cost money. And if we get a model which has a good productivity but does not need all of the coefficients, you know, there is a monetary advantage to that. Or you need to you know, bother the patient less. You know? um, so it would be nice to have a model where the coefficients go strictly to zero. And we will look at probably the most important one, the lasso, right after the break. <laughs>